widespread evolutionary fraud. And now 150 frauds have been documented. It's a fake. Is the scientific community really that reliable? It's fiction. We made it up. The theory of evolution has collapsed. What exactly are they hiding from us? They found the rest of the animal years later. Guess what? Pachycetus is a land animal. Guess what? It doesn't have flippers. Guess what? The hole for the nose is at the tip like a dog. The whole My goodness. thing was wrong. Are they really just lying to themselves? Hey friends, incredible story to share with you today. You all know how I like to downplay evolution as a modern farce. We made it up. And for good reason, because in a moment you'll meet Dr. Carl Werner, who, believe it or not, has documented widespread fraud among the top tier of evolutionary scientists. It's a fake. Look, I'm gonna be honest. This is gonna get me a little fired up and I hope it does you too, because this story involves scientists altering their ape man fossils, creating imaginary human ancestors from oops, barnyard animal bones, and literally stretching the facts in order to secure funding for more of their fake evolutionary finds. Dr. Warner dismantled what we've all been told by gaining exclusive access to original ape man fossils yeah. on multiple continents and conducting exclusive interviews with the biggest names in the evolutionary community. Dr. Warner received his undergraduate degree in biology with distinction at the University of Missouri while graduating summa cum laude he received his doctoral degree in medicine at the age of 23. Formerly, he was an adjunct assistant professor in the Department of Surgery at St. Louis University, and he's the author of several books, including The Evolution, The Grand Experiment, book and accompanying video series. Dr. Carl, thanks for joining us today. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Tonight, AJ, I'm going to share with you the biggest scientific news of our lifetime. That is widespread fraud has been uncovered and documented in the field of human evolution. Now, when I use the word fraud, I'm use, defining that as the scientist is knowingly misleading others, not a mistake. You know, many people have suspected that ape men, that is the theoretical evolutionary animals between apes and humans, were either frauds or lies or just made up stories. But since the fossils of ape men were kept off limits, even from the very beginning in the 1880s, not only to the public, but also to other scientists, it was impossible to verify that any particular ape man was real. 27 years ago, my wife and I embarked on a project to rectify this lack of access to filming, uh, to lack of access of the fossils by filming a television documentary on human evolution for national television. And during this time, we photograph hundreds of original ape man fossils in the vaults of the museums and universities all over the world. And in this process, we documented 150 acts of fraud. The frauds are not esoteric, some one-off ape men, but involve the most common ape men that you know of, such as Lucy, Neanderthal man, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Prometheus, Tumai, Zinjanthropus, and many, many others. And now that these frauds have been unmasked, Darwin's entire theory of naturalism, that is that everything came about naturally, without the help of God has been overturned. And I'm gonna wow. explain that shortly. Yeah. Now, you may ask yourself, why does this even matter? You know, what's the big controversy? What difference does it make if humans evolved from apes millions of years ago, or if just humans were created by God in the Garden of Eden thousands of years ago? Well. Actually, it matters quite a lot. And this issue for me had a profound negative impact on me as my life played out during my teenage years. And it's having a profound negative impact on your children currently, your nephews, your nieces, your friends. 
And it's not a, uh, an idea that's, you know, not important. And I want to explain. When I was a teenager, this is how I reasoned. If the universe formed naturally from a Big Bang billions of years ago, and I was taught that, from the interaction just of hydrogen atoms, not necessarily God doing anything, it just happened. And if life began naturally on Earth, you know, after the Earth cooled from the Big Bang and um, there was just chemicals on the Earth, and just from the interaction of molecules, a single cell organism, that is a bacteria formed. And then if later all living things on earth evolved from this bacteria, like humans and hippos and palm trees, and it was all natural, then the possibility exists that there is no God. Really? If, yeah, if, yeah. if you don't need any of that, if you don't need God for any of those steps, then, you know, maybe this whole God thing is made up. And if there's no God, the scriptures about God creating the world in six days are all made up. And if that's true, why should I follow religion? So I reasoned as a teenager. Why should I not party, smoke, eat, drink, and be merry? Essentially, naturalism and Darwinism made the Bible into a scrap of paper for me. Unimportant. But what if the opposite happened to be true and you could show it, that it was impossible for the universe to form naturally? And if it was impossible for a living cell to form naturally from chemicals, and it was impossible for a small bacteria to change into a human or a hippo or a palm tree by accidental mutations. If those things are impossible, then it points to a God who created the universe, the earth and all living things on earth. And today I stand here and reason and plead, if you don't want to end up on the wrong side of the equation, maybe in hell sometime after you died, you better figure out if you were created and if, there, if you were, who is the creator and how does he want you to live? This question is actually the most important question of our lifetime and trumps all other questions about philosophy and life. You know, you might ask yourself, Carl, you're a physician. Why do you have the um, ability to even speak on this topic? You know, you treat sore throats. Why could you even comment on this? And that's a really good question, a fair question. And it might surprise you to know that physicians have been involved in the creation evolution debate since the beginning. Now, these are physicians, and yet they disproved um, different pieces of Darwinian or other types of uh, naturalism. For example, August Weissman, MD, disproved Darwin's idea that if you used your muscles that um, you and get them built up, that your children would be born with big muscles. That's what Darwin believed. And Francesco Reddy, who's a physician, he disproved Aristotle's claim that um, maggots, which are living, came from non-living meat. And he simply disproved the, that by putting some cheesecloth over the meat and preventing flies from laying their eggs on the meat. But, you know, without these two physicians, you know, we'd still be back in the dark ages. And the other piece to this question, whether I have the authority to speak on this topic, because I'm just a physician, is that on the pro-evolution side, many of the scientists who made the big discoveries of ape men were just physicians who were treating sore throats. And that would be Davidson Black, who discovered Peking Man, Eugene Du Bois, who discovered the famous Homo erectus or Pithecanthropus, Raymond Dart, who discovered the Tong Child, and Robert Broom, 
uh, who discovered Mrs. Plas, the adult form of Australopithecines. These were only physicians. They didn't have any training, and yet they were able to contribute to the discussion. And you could make the case that everyone in the audience actually has more training than some of the evolution scientists. For example, these four scientists lacked training in science. <laughs> and many of you would be considered far above them intellectually as far as your training. For example, Florentino Amagino wow. discovered five, eight men. Yeah, and he dropped out of high school, sophomore year of high school, never went back, never went to college, but they call him doctor. He calls himself doctor because he got an honorary degree. <laughs> And he founded the Museum of Anthropology in University of Cordoba. And then he was the president of the two largest museums in Buenos Aires area. Uh, L Richard Leakey, who made many, many discoveries in Kenya, had no college. He never went to college. And Darwin, he never had a science degree. He went to med school and then dropped out. And then his degree was in how to be a pastor, like a religious, I don't know what you would call that. Holy AJ. cow. Well, he yeah, created a religion. Was, so. Well, he did, but the wrong religion. <laughs> and then, you know, uh, Van Riet Lowe down in South Africa, he found all these eight man tools. He said he didn't have a science degree. He just was a civil engineer building bridges, you know. So anybody who says, you know, all of us can't discuss this and have to put in our two cents, it's this wrong because if the evolutionists can do, use their MDs and the evolutionists can use their high school dropouts, then the creationists can too. Now, I want to tell you my story of how it was possible that I uncovered 150 frauds. That's an incredible story. And uh, why didn't somebody else do it before me? Why it's been 170 years or whatever why hasn't someone else come up with this number and how did you get to this how, how did the opportunity avail itself well i got to back up a little bit and start in um my childhood and just walk you through it real quick now during my childhood i grew up in a christian family and my parents were amazing i'm serious they were very moral they were great people but our church oddly enough, did not teach that the Bible wasn't inherent. In fact, Noah's flood was never taught, yeah. and six-day creation wasn't taught, and evolution was not discussed. But then during my high school years, I found myself, because of my reasoning, slowly drifting away from God and away from my family. And I began to ask myself, why am I following all of these religious rules? And why am I going to church? Just like many high school kids might say today. And then when I got to college, I was taught on day one that evolution was a fact by my professors in medical school. And they were using outdated and disproved evidences from evolution, but I had no preparation or reason to question evolution as taught by my professors, I was adrift in life. And now being rudderless and all this more information that evolution was true and naturalism, my drift away from God accelerated and I ultimately became miserable. Mm. Even though I had all the freedom I wanted, I, I became the more freedom I had, the more miserable I got. Then the pizza date came into my life. And you might consider writing down these questions that occurred because during this date, uh, it's not a date, it was just a friend took me out and we went out for pizza. But during this get together, he asked me three questions. You might want to jot them down because they literally changed my life. Yeah. Um, now, you know, this friend who in retrospect was a Christian said, let's go out to Minsky's Pizza Parlor and um, talk about classes and things like that. And I get it. Let's do it. We can't get food at the dorm on Sunday night. So you have to go out and to eat that one time. So yeah, let's go. So um, I have to 
give you my background because I was kind of a science geek. Um, first of all, I was during this conversation, I was 19 years old and I was already in medical school. I got accepted to a six year accelerated medical school, which is kind of unusual, but it's, it's not all that unusual. And in high school, I got a four year science scholarship to the University of Missouri for research I had done during high school. In high school, I had my own animal lab at the University of Missouri. Holy cow. And yeah, and uh, I had, was injecting food preservatives and then measuring this, and I got this sci science scholarship. So now at the pizza parlor, I'm 19 years old, I'm in medical school, I'm 4.0ing through my undergraduate degree in biology, which you do, do you do those simultaneous, your biology, undergraduate degree, and your medical school. And I'm thinking I'm Mr. Science, you know, probably a little pride, but um, my friend asked me three questions as the pizza date was winding down. He said, Carl, have you ever thought about how the universe could form naturally from nothing? <laughs> you know, not a typical like a, pizza date question, right? <laughs> It is for two kids in medical school because okay. he was also 19, and this guy was smart too. I always, says, I always went the uh, you know the the religious pastoral track. So, <laughs> yeah. no, he asked me, "Do you ever think about how the universe could form from nothing, like in the Big Bang, since the laws of physics state that matter doesn't form naturally from nothing under any conditions?" Mm. So, in other words, Carl. How could the universe start in the Big Bang if you can't form matter? Matter being hydrogen, helium, you know, the atoms. You oh, know. yeah, yeah. And um, I thought about it. And it, it was like a truism. It's like, yeah, how, how does that work? Now, th this you, is kind of, it might be a dumb question. Was, was he a believer, this guy, or this was just a... He was a believer. Okay. He was a believer, and he was on a mission. Okay. And I was his, and I, I was his missionary field. Okay. <laughs> and um, I was dumbfounded. I couldn't answer his question. It's such a simple question. And I knew this about physics, that it says that matter does not form from nothing. Yeah. And yet I never applied it to the origin of the universe, you know. And then he asked a second question. These were like one, two, three, all over in about three and a half minutes. He says, Carl, how could the first form of life, like a bacteria, form after the Big Bang on the Earth? Um, you know, as the Earth cooled, there's only chemicals, then a little tiny bacteria, you can't even see them. You have to, they're smaller than a pinhead. How could a bacteria form naturally because you know, Carl, that the components of all living cells, there's not, a, there's not a living cell on the planet that doesn't have DNA, RNA, proteins, and enzymes. These are the big molecules, the big macromolecules. And you know, Carl, that those components, necessary components, DNA, RNA, enzymes, and, and, and functional cell membranes and pro enzymes do not form under any condition ever. In other words, you can't take a beaker of water, put some carbon in there and shake it and put some <laughs> acid and alkali and, and emulsify it, and oxygenate it, and electrify it. And I knew this was correct because we were in biochemistry at this point in our second year of medical school. And I knew he was right that den enzymes and DNA and RNA can never form naturally. And I never applied those rules of science to evolution. And so like, how could the first single cell bacteria form if you can't form the, the, the products, the necessary components? And then he asked, with over, and he said 200 million, but now the number's up to 1 billion. With, with over a billion fossils found by scientists and collected, and they're in the museums, a billion, why don't we see one animal group slowly evolving into another animal group in the fossils, such as a shrew evolving into a bat or a dog evolving into a whale? With such a rich fossil record, 
why can't we see the major animal groups forming over time? They just suddenly appear in the fossil record. Mm. You couldn't appeal to a, a poor fossil record because it's an enormous fossil record. So why would they be missing for all the groups? I was, I, I was just speechless. Like, that, it's just such, again, it was a truism. And I, but I didn't know if he was right. I thought he, he might be wrong on this because I couldn't verify what he was saying. The other two points I, I get, but um, then his final little salvo, he says, I bet you can't prove evolution, even if you tried. And now I was silenced. I could not answer any of these questions. I now realized he had just presented th enough evidence that there was the existence of God and I didn't know what to do with it. I pondered these questions for 18 years. And I asked myself, is naturalism even true? Was my friend right that it was impossible? And I began to read lots of books on science, evolution, origin of life, geology, dinosaurs creation, but I had no real answers. Wow. I get it. Yeah. Yeah, I get it because, you know, the, the, you can't form the universe. You can't form living things and the fossil record doesn't show up. But what do you do with dinosaurs? What do you do with the millions of years? What do you do with ape men? What do you do about the good proofs? You know, I had so many questions. You, you know, what's amazing was, about this is this is the same conversation that normally happens between uh, an evolutionary scientist and a Bible believing Christian or a young earth creationist where they dismantle their faith. But you're having in that moment, I've never heard anybody describe it like this before, but I mean, you have a Christian dismantling your evolutionary faith and you, and, and you're not even realizing it. Oh, I realize it. I, I, I realize I had just been whooped and uh, I didn't tell him, I didn't tell I, I didn't tell him, but, and I, you know, we were left there. I never, you know, let on, oh my gosh, yeah. I just have to think about this. But, it, you know, I, the seed had been planted. I realized there was a God at that point, but I didn't know what I was well, going to well, be. Well, it's, it's amazing because it's just those simple questions. I don't think I've ever heard an evolutionist say, and, and I don't know if you're just more honest than the rest of them, but like, I, I don't think I've ever heard an evolutionist describe it like that. And those questions are good questions. I mean, they, they shook you. They shook me. And if you go into a museum, the museums never present those questions, which would be valid questions for everyone to, to, to know that those are problems in their theory. But no, they hide this because they're evolution priests. The museums are trying to promote the religion of evolution. That's why. So after 18 years, I did what the normal American boy would do, you know, our man, you know, well, I don't know, I'm just going to go ahead and form my own television production company. And uh, I know that you would have done that. And that's what I did. You know, <laughs> And the reason I did that was that I needed to get access to the scientists, and I needed to get access to the fossils to investigate evolution, because I still had a lot of verifying and all that to do. I realized if I went as a television production company, I could get access to both. And uh, that's what we did. We filmed all the famous scientists in many of the evolution fields. Um, there's Dr. John, Don Johansson, who discovered Lucy. There's uh, Gunter Viol, who, who works at where Archaeopteryx was found in Jura Museum. And um, there's James Kirkland and et cetera, wow. et cetera, et cetera. So we filmed these interviews uh, there's F. Clark Howell who wrote the time life chart that has an ape to human chart. Holy you know, cow. Yeah, yeah. 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 And this guy here is in charge of the, um, he, he writes about the origin of animal groups, et cetera, et cetera. We went in all to um, 100, we interviewed 104 scientists over 27 years. And we went to at, 104 museums all over the world and film fossils. Wow. And now, this is important because th these these names you're dropping, I mean, uh, your average listener right now might not realize, I mean, th these are the big names in evolutionary science. I mean, the ones that have been alive over the course of the last 50 plus years, those are yes. all the big names. You, you 
spoke with him personally. Yes, and it wasn't just in one field. We did the human evolution experts, the bad evolution experts, the pterosaur evolution experts, the bird evolution experts, and an evolution scientist would recognize 90 of the 104 scientists that we interviewed because they are they're the leaders of their field, yeah. And many times they were the ones on camera who told us that there was fraud in this field. So I'm not making anything up and everything is so verifiable. So yeah. uh, hang on to your seats. We actually interviewed in total 104 scientists at 104 museums. We went to 24 dig sites all over the world, South Africa, uh, South America, all throughout Europe. We filmed fossils at 18 different universities. We filmed the series, a video series in 16 countries, which is crazy, on six continents. So yeah, this is a thorough vetting of what's going on. And at the end of the story is my conclusion that my friend was right over pizza at age 19 when he told me a billion fossils have been collected and evolution doesn't show up in the fossil record. And I got to explain that. Don't don't judge. To, don't jump to conclusions yet. Let me explain that and let me tell you why I'm saying that. And it becomes very clear. You know, the fossil record has a billion fossils collected. That's a thousand museums with a million fossils each museum on average. That's a billion. And these fossils aren't just, you know, some big dinosaur bones. They're all the things that show you that a fossil record is complete. Things like bacteria, which you wouldn't think a bacteria would even fossilize, or fish eggs. They have them in fossilized forms, which are soft. You know, you wouldn't think those would fossilize. Or animal embryos. These are just a few cells large, and they were uh, fossilized and recovered. And jellyfish, which you wouldn't think those would be fossilized, and worms and flowers. The fossil record is so incredible. There's 900 million fossil invertebrates collected. 900 million. So it should show evolution, but it doesn't. It's the opposite. It shows no evolution, non-evolution. It shows the the fact that there was a creation and then a flood. It's not evolution. Now, Hold on to your seats. Let me explain these things. Don't jump to conclusions because I'm saying things you've never heard before. You might find that they're, uh, you know, unbelievable. And I would be shaking my head. I don't believe this guy myself, but please give me just 30 minutes to go through this evidence and you're going to be appalled. And now the Christians are going to jump all over this. And this is going to be their favorite topic to whack on their atheist family members. So here we go. My friend said that big fossil record and the animal groups just suddenly appear. Now, out of all the animals in the world, 99% of them fit into these seven categories. The categories for animals are called phyla. It would be like the sponge, sponges, the shellfish, the worms, the arthropods, the corals, and the vertebrates like fish and other vertebrates. All seven groups appear Suddenly. Now, how do I know this? Because we filmed at the lowest rock layers having animals. You know, we went to uh, South Australia in Adelaide, where the Eddie Karen layer was, which is supposed to be the, the lowest layer with animals in it, and then animals and plants. And then we went and filmed at the Smithsonian, the next layer up, the Cambrian. And these are the problem layers because before that, all you have is bacteria and then suddenly you have all these groups just suddenly appear. And the more you know about this, the, these are fossils that were found in these two lowest layers. And the first thing you say is some of those look modern. And the next thing you say is they don't even look like half evolved. They all look like complete animals already. And let me just show you, we'll go through all se seven of them, I believe here. Here is a living sea pen. And, you know, it's living in the ocean today. Here is a fossil sea pen, and it's in the lowest layer, and it's a foot and a half big. It's huge, and there's no connection between a bacteria, which, 
by the way, the bacteria wouldn't be this big. It would be, you couldn't see it. It would be smaller than a pinhead. Yeah. There's no, there's no intermediates between the bacteria and the C, and the C pen. In other words, there should be intermediate animals between um, the two, like the animal D should be half C pen, you know, just, it doesn't really look like a full C pen. Animal G should be almost a C pen, but it's not really. Animal A should look like a bacteria that's starting to grow or something like that. There's no an intermediate animals, A, B, C, D, E, F, or G, H. It's just bacteria and C pen. No evolution seen in the fossil record. And you go to the next one. This is, my wife picked this um, echinoderm off of a beach when we were in New Zealand filming. And echinoderm are the animals that have five-fold symmetry, like a starfish has five legs, a brittle star has five legs. This echinoderm has 10 uh, tentacles. And if you'll notice, this echinoderm here, the fossil, you can see, looks pretty much like this, um, th this live echinoderm. Well, it's just dead. It just washed up onto the beach in in, in uh, New Zealand. If you see here, here's the stem crinoid, see this? And here's the stem over here. And then it has the body and then these 10 tentacles. And here they are, you can see them. And these just suddenly appear. There's no intermediate between a bacteria and this animal. And you go to the next animal, like a bristle worm. These suddenly appear. Now, bristle worms are very dear to my heart and my wife's heart. And I'll tell you why. My wife and I were filming in the Caribbean and we were diving and filming and she came up to the boat and and she was not happy and she wasn't happy with me and she was not happy about being out in the ocean. She doesn't swim very good. And um, you don't think that she might look abnormal, but to me, she's like, what happened to you? If you'll notice her upper lip is all swollen. Why did it, what happened, Debbie? Well, she got bit by a bristle worm. This is current, and yet bristle worms are at the bottom layer of the rocks, and there's no intermediates. So here on this slide is a modern bristle worm, and then the fossil bristle worm found in the Cabrian that's on display at the Smithsonian. Here's a picture of the fossil to the right of it, and above it is a drawing of the fossil. And you could see that they look the they same. They look the same. And yet it's the lowest layer and worse than that, that they look the same and unchanged is that there's no intermediates between this microscopic bacteria and the, the worm. And it goes on and on like that. The arthropods, like this trilobite, there's 217,000 trilobites have been collected, but not a single ancestor to trilobites. That's Incredible. Everyone yeah. And, you know, the and, reason this is important is because many people may not have thought this through because they just look through the ape men, but you have to have transitionary forms for, for every, every species. That's right. And they should all be as, as thorough and more, you know, so yeah. many ape men, there should be so many of these intermediates, just as many as they have for ape men. Yeah. You have, you have to be able no. to trace from the original bacteria all the way to modern man. Yeah, and every and, other modern creature we have. Yeah, and you have to go from the bacterium to the trilobite here, and it's it's weird. There's and only that's not three animals. There. Yeah, <laughs> and it's not there, and that's why the eight men fossils are suspicious because they stand out. Like, why here do you find all these fossils? And I'm going to show you why they did. <laughs> Here's a sponge that was uh, a, a recreated sponge from the lowest layer at the Smithsonian, again, they just suddenly appear, no ancestors. And guess what? The vertebrates appear in the Cambrian. This is from the lowest Cambrian in China, South China. I don't know if you can see that fish there. There's mm -hmm. a dorsal fin above it. And it just suddenly appears. There's no half animal there. It just suddenly appears in the Cambrian. You can the see lowest the scales on the, on the side of the fish in the fossil, I am I right? So. I think so, but you got to be careful because that could just be artifact. Okay. Uh, but you can see uh, it looks like ribs, you know. And um, so, yeah. So my friend was correct that all the animal groups suddenly appear. And it's not only the animal group phyla, the seven phyla, arthropods, corals, sponges, you know, vertebrates. But even within those groups, then 
the animals are appearing suddenly all the way up the rock layers. And by the way, these rock layers aren't ordered like they suggest they are, but let me just go through the vertebrates, for example. Now, they have collected 500,000 fish, and these aren't just, you know, a piece of a scale. These are enormously complete fish And fossils. this is in you the Cambrian. See? No, oh, I'm sorry, I'm switching. I'm sorry, I'm switching. I've finished with Cambrian. Now I'm just saying, just in general, the fossil record, okay. thanks for clarifying that. Just in general, um, all the, even within these seven phyla that just suddenly appeared in the Cambrian, now you go further up in the theoretical geological column, well, you should be able to see fish form. You know, not just one fish, but all the fish groups like the sharks, the rays, you know, the coelacanth group, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. They've collected all of these fish. So you're expecting, right, to see the evolution of the fish. And lo and behold, there are no ancestors to the different types of fish. For example, on this chart, the dots show no fossils and the solid lines, which are colored, show the animals. So like sharks just appear, lampreys just appear. Wow. Um, yeah, uh, the bony fish just appear, the lungfish just appear in the face of a half a million fish. So that just doesn't make any sense. There's no you, those fossils should be evenly distributed for every group. And then for within these groups, it should be evenly distributed if evolution occurred. And all they have is the final product. And I'm not saying this. These evolution scientists that we interviewed here on these screens, they're the ones that are saying this. And for bats, they have collected the most extraordinary fossils, just the bats, a thousand of them. And you can see these gorgeous photos that my wife took when you say a thousand you mean a thousand different types of bats is that what you mean or no uh like there's there's lots and lots of types of bats but they collected 1000 rocks like these on the screen here that had a bat in it okay yeah so they had collected 1000 individual bats as fossils and uh, they're they're Look at the details. You can see the wings. You can see what they ate for dinner last night. Now, cetera, this, this might be a, a dumb question, but is the no such thing. is the are the bat fossils that they found like this? You're saying that they found that's all the bat fossils they have. Is there? That's right. That's all they have. But you know what? That's a heck of a collection for just one little animal that you wouldn't even think would be preserved. You have a thousand of them. Okay, if you got a thousand yeah. bats. I want to see the animals that evolved into the bats, and I want to see the half bat evolving. So look at this. They think a tree shrew evolved into a bat. And once again, even though they have a thousand bats, they have no animals on the intermediate evolutionary line. Animals A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Animal D would be theoretically half shrew, half bat, partially evolved wings. Animal G would be almost a bat, but the wings aren't quite long enough. And animal B would look like a shrew with some long front legs, but no wings and no animals intermediates. But for most animal groups, they admit, no, we don't have anything like that. Like dinosaurs, they've collected 100,000 dinosaurs. And yet there are no ancestors to any dinosaur species, according to this expert who wrote the Bible on dinosaur evolution. That should make you sit up and say, wait a minute, this guy has a point. If, and if, these, aren't his, if these aren't his numbers, which they're not, they're their numbers. And I'm just sh clarifying it for you. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, here we go. I am going to just blow this thing out of the water when we go further. I would like to show you now, those were all no ancestors for anything. I want to show you the three best proofs for evolution in general, because, and this would not be the lowest layers again, it's just in general, all the rock layers combined. Okay, you believe in evolution and you say it's true. Show us the best, because I think Carl Warner here is just hoodwinking us. He's just not showing <laughs> us the best proofs. No, seriously, I think that would, somebody would say if they're an evolution scientist, they would, or evolution student, they say, he's just hiding the best proofs. How about this, how about this? Well, there are three best proofs for evolution in the fossil record, and that's whales evolving from a dog-like animal, birds evolving 
from a dinosaur and humans evolving from an ape. And it just so happens that I did interviews on all three of them. This is supposed to be the best. And this should be just, just rock solid and it should just like, oh, well, evolution is true because at least these three examples, you can see it perfectly. And watch what the best proofs are when you go to investigate them. This is Dr. Phil Gingrich. He found this animal, a walking whale. It's halfway evolved between a land animal with four legs and a whale. It was so important in 1983, April, he was on the, not he, but his fossil uh, walking <laughs> whale was on the cover of science. It doesn't get any better than that as far as fame and glory. And you'll notice it has four legs with flippers and a blowhole. You see that blowhole in front? Oh, yeah. It's not... It's not like a dog where the snout, the, the blow, you know, the nose is at the tip of the of the face, but the blowholes on the whales are halfway up. So he has flippers, four legs, and a blowhole, and he becomes famous. We went and interviewed him, and we said we'd like to see these fossils. Oh, I'm going to show you the fossils of this creature. Watch this. There you go. <laughs> Now it's, it's, you you know, this is unbelievable. I I mean, it's, it's, uh, I, I mean, this is, this is deception. Would you agree with that? Well, just hold on. It's not fraud yet. It's just, they got a little bit, uh, overzealous. Okay. Okay. We're not there yet. Yeah. Yeah. But look at here. (laughs) You see the gray part on the fossil? Yeah. The dark gray, charcoal gray. That's the parts that were found well that's what i'm saying what we just saw a picture of him with the whole skull yeah and and oh i'm sorry that was not the skull of this creature he i did I I just see. a picture okay of him. okay yeah yeah this is a skull and i have that separately but i just happen to have that picture of him i should have i shouldn't have put that in there i should have but it's this skull which is part of this creature pachycetus but the fine print is that he put those three or four teeth, uh, seven teeth, and this little bone into a whale skull to get this skull. And then from there, he got the whole animal. He developed the whole animal drawing. You see, he has just a fragments of a skull, and he's gone to a whole walking whale, yeah. the, best proof, the best proof of whales evolving from a land animal. Now, now just so I understand was, what you're saying, those, those gray... Uh, parts of the skull drawing that's all that he found yes correct? okay but he developed he, was, he took that now you said added uh when you say he added them did he add di- a different kind of teeth in there or no look at um like this bone it's light gray yeah that is not part of the original fossils that's part of a different okay whale. that's what i thought okay yeah he put that onto a whale skull so he took his bones that he yeah. found Put them in a whale skull. Well, how do you even know it's a whale? Yeah. You know, why wouldn't you put it in a dog head or something like that? So there you go. And you'll notice wow. it has a it has a blowhole here. It's going to get worse here. Hold on. Here's a blowhole. And see, the blowhole is on the, both the picture and the fossil. You see that? Oh, it's yeah. not at the tip. Okay. Now here's the next slide. They found the rest of the animal years later, and this is what it looks like. It looks like a land animal. Guess what? Pachycetus is a land animal. Guess what? It doesn't have flippers. Guess what? It doesn't have a blowhole. The no, the hole for the nose is at the tip like a dog. The whole My goodness. thing was wrong. But there's that's not the only walking whale. We got two more that he and his colleague at the same university found two men found the three walking whales that are the most important that's odd too yeah how could two guys that work together see each other every day they're just happened they're the only ones in the world that just happened to run into these things well there's one he then found another walking whale which was this one rhodocetus you see the the cat-like animal at the top evolving into the whale at the bottom Rhodocetus, he said it was a walking whale. It had a whale's tail, it had flippers, and a blowhole. And we went to interview him, and we realized this is what the actual fossils he had. 
laid on top of his diagram. In other words, he didn't have the tail. Can you see that the tail bones are missing? Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. And the feet he either, did, correct? He didn't have the feet or flippers either. And the skull is kind of gnarly at the very end, so you really don't know what's going on there. And he admitted during our interview, which is in the first episode of our eight-part miniseries on evolution, he admitted, I don't think it does have a whale's tail. I put it there speculatively, and now that I think about it, I don't think it has flippers either. And yet, you know, how many kids saw this or still see it or are referring to Rhodocetus as a, a walking whale? And then here's the last one. I don't want to spend too much time on this because I got to get to the human stuff. Wow. But um, the, here's his partner, his graduate student, Hans Thewesen, who found the third walking whale in the diagram called Ambulocetus. And we said we'd like to see the fossil. He pulls it out. We film it. And there's a problem. The features that show it's a whale aren't there. Now, what what he the the colored bones are the actual fossil the gray bone is his reconstruction that he guessed at the, so the only thing that's real on this is the colored bones and you see where the blowhole is he has no bones of the blowhole and yet he puts a blowhole on it and see that you see that i, I are you able to understand that I'm, i i am I, I i'm it. what i'm wondering is because i i did go through your um you know, your book on uh, the transitionary forms for for supposed transitionary forms for humans to, and apes. And what I what I suspected before, but what you detailed at length is the the amount of these supposed skulls that are actually just fragments of things. Yes. You know, That's and how so I, I guess what, what I'm I'm looking at, the, at this picture going when something is broken into so many pieces, is this even credible? I'm amazed that some of these things are accepted, I guess, within the scientific yeah. community as legitimate yeah. fossils. And you'd, and you'd always want to say, okay, where's the critical parts that you're saying proves that it's a whale? Like, where's the blowhole? Yeah. Oh, we don't have the blowhole. Right. And you know what? In the interview, he admitted that that blowhole is probably not in the right place. It probably should be on the end. It's it, it just like every time I go do the interviews to investigate, these guys admit what they created there's the best proofs are not it's not best proofs and wow. there's also problems with his proof that it was a whale because of the ear bullet but i won't go into that but anyway um yeah it didn't have a blowhole but they displayed it as a blowhole the recreated model which is on top there has a blowhole but all of that is false and um the second best proof of evolution Again, I just got to do this in about three minutes. I, I, otherwise, we're not going to get to the ape men issue. Is this that birds evolved from dinosaurs? And this is the oldest bird ever found. It was found at Solenhofen, Germany, Archaeopteryx. And you know what? They say this is a flying dinosaur. You know what? I have a problem with that. You know, I've, I think if you showed your four year old son, what is that, son? Is that a dinosaur? Or is it a bird? You know, I think 99.9% .9 of the humans on earth would say that is a bird. It looks like a pheasant. This is the oldest bird ever found. Okay. So where is the intermediate between a dinosaur and that bird? On the left is, I just put this dinosaur in there, Coelophysis. He's about 10 feet long or something. And that's a dinosaur on the left. And on the right is that bird fossil. And it's only about a foot tall, that fossil we photographed. But there's no intermediates between going backwards to the layers below it, between this bird, Archaeopteryx, and a dinosaur. The intermediates A through H are missing. And if that's not enough problems, a lot of the fossils that they say are intermediates are either fake or they're problematic. Like this one was in National Geographic. They said it's a flying dinosaur. But if you, we interviewed the fellow who did the CAT scan on this, and here's the fossil on the left and the top right. That's the same fossil. When he CAT scanned it, he realized that this flying dinosaur was actually made out of a dinosaur tail and 
bird parts. And this was created in China. China has a whole industry of creating false fossils and they'll amalgamate, bring in two animals and put them together on the same slab. My and, goodness. Um, yeah, that was uncovered by BBC, um, the dinosaur that fooled the world. Which now, I think I heard fossil. this one. Is that Archaeoraptor? Is that? Uh, this is Archaeoraptor, yes. Okay. So we did Archaeopteryx. It looks like a bird. Archaeoraptor was uh, a dinosaur tail attached to a bird body. And um, not to belabor this topic, but there's other problems with hum with bird evolution too. And here is the big one in that in the upper layers of dinosaurs where T-Rex is, what do they find next to the T-Rex fossils in that layer, the Cretaceous layer? What do you think they find? They find ducks, loons, avocets, um, uh, penguins, Flamingos. Now, these are not my words. These are words by the evolution scientists. Oh, we found a parrot next to a dinosaur. You can watch all their interviews in our eight-part series. So, wait a minute. Dinosaurs evolved into modern birds, but you're saying modern birds, like a duck, were found next to the dinosaurs? Uh, that doesn't even make sense. And then they have a few that came after Archaeopteryx, and guess what? Most of these fossils are from Liaoning, China, the same place where this one came from, Archaeoraptor. Wow. Yeah, and they actually have an industry. You go into a shop, what you want? You want a dinosaur bird? You want what you want, <laughs> a walking whale? No, you know, they do it with the, what fossils they have, but they'll assemble what you want, and you can't tell that they're fakes. And until they open up every CAT scan and we are able to see every fossil, no way. This you know, is just too weak. And again, why this is important is because, like you said, I mean, this this was shown, uh, I can't remember what magazine, if it was National Geographic or... Yes. But these things are presented to the public, to the populace, uh, as though they are proof of evolution. And then all of a sudden you find out, no, it's a fake, but they don't come out and retract the fossils. You still see them presented in museums and textbooks and things like that. And I know you've detailed the extent to which this happens. Now, they have taken Archaeoraptor lionensis down, but it's an embarrassment. But you have to now go back and just think about this. We just did whales and we just did birds. They're full of really hokey stuff. And this is the best yeah. proof for evolution using the fossils. And there's one more. And that is that humans evolved from apes. And this would be the third best proof for evolution. We got all these intermediates between an ape and a human. And so there you go. But when we did our human evolution interviews, I wanna show you what, how this diagram got modified based on what the evolution scientists told us. This is a corrected diagram. 12 of these are fraudulent. Two of them are just mistakes, but they're not, they weren't frauds, but they were, fraud. so the bulk of these were fraudulent. And I'm gonna explain that, not today, wow. but in our next show. This whole diagram just decimated the world population because they thought it presented that evolution of humans was true. And I want to tell you about how we uncovered 150 frauds in the field of human evolution, because that's what we're here to talk about. But I had to give you all this so you understand that nothing else works in this whole idea. You know, the origin of the universe, origin of life, origin of bacteria, origin of the phylum, origin of all these animals, they just suddenly appear. But why was Carl Warner, how did he find all these frauds. And I didn't find all of them. I was told about them. They were pointed out to me, et cetera, et cetera. But, but how did he go about documenting this? Well, I'm going to give you uh, the, the truth is I almost missed it. I almost missed the biggest story of the century. It was right in front of me. And I got to explain how this happened. We then start after we did the, um, the fossil books, then we did the human evolution book. It's volume three and four. And we started doing interviews and 
we realize that many of the ape men that have been reported to me personally and to everybody over the years turned out to be not ape men. They said initially, oh, it's an ape man, but then it would later it would be turn out to be something else. And I started to work on counting them. Okay, how many ape men have been overturned? That's just how I think. You know, I'm going to start there. And it turns out that 232 species of ape men have been overturned. Now, you can see that list in our volume four. 232 species of ape men have been overturned. Well, what did they turn out to be? There were so many ape men that were overturned. I had to devise a system. To, so just to think about them, you know, it was like, well, I'll divide them into categories of what they ended up being. So my first book on human evolution was this one. It's called Untold Stories of Human Evolution. And uh, it's a beautiful, easy to read book. I want to show this to you so you can understand it. Oops, oh, I got to get where you can see this. Anybody can read this book. It's just stories. You, you don't need a science degree. You can understand what they're saying. You can see the mistakes they made, et cetera, et cetera. This book is called Untold Stories of Human Evolution. And basically, it is the first category of overturned ape men. And that is ape men made out of barnyard animals. Now, My you heard goodness. me right. You're Barnyard talking like animals. a pig or a, uh, a, a pig. dog or a dog. You, you, you're two for two. Keep going. <laughs> a, a pig. What about an alligator? They ever make one out of an alligator? Now that's not a barnyard. Yes, they did, but uh, <laughs> but that's not a barnyard. That's not a barnyard animal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So you're three for three, but you, the barnyard animals that they made. I'm gonna play the lottery of. today. Yes. This whole book that I just showed you is the stories of the eight men that were made out of barnyard animals and others, non-primate mammals. See, these, these, these aren't even primates. It was made out of dog bones, cat bones, uh, horse bones, donkey bones, bovid, which would be like a cow bone, um, and uh, a oh, raccoon leg bone, and a pig tooth, and a dolphin. None of those are primates, but they formed the first category of overturned ape men, eight men that were made out of non-primate mammals. Now, there's only really five eight men, but like one of the eight men that Dr. Dart found, he mixed up about, you know, six of these animals into one. Others were just one, you know, the dolphin rib was just My one goodness. ape man. Yeah. So that's the first category of overturned ape men. And, and when you and say like, this too, these, this, these are ape men that the evolutionary community has overturned. I, yeah, I think it's that's all, an, yeah, no, it's all a great. That's an no, important point is, because, I mean, you know, if somebody were just jumping into this, they might think, oh, this is just a creationist, you know. A wacky, saying, wacky creationist, yeah. <laughs> but but these are things like, you know, I, I and, and your book is very easy to understand. I, I went through, mm -hmm. uh, I, I went through, I think, volume four. Is that the... Uh, Nine categories of the nine categories ape of overturned ape men. Yeah, yep. I went, so I went. I went yep. through that one, and, and it's almost like you're anticipating in the book questions that people are going to ask. The way you have arrows pointing to things and different things highlighted, lots of pictures. You know, um, I I am actually an educated person, but I still need the pictures, especially for stuff like this, where I I want to know what it, what is it that people found. You know, you you do a great job of of, I think, showing that and making it very easy to understand, you know. But but this is yeah, important no. because when I was reading your book, what I discovered was, oh, oh, this is, these are things that the evolutionary community has overturned. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong on this, your point is that probably that you're going to make in a second is that basically for the first hundred years of, of their history, they've overturned them all. They've overturned they themselves, but they, they don't publicize that. In but fact, they've overturned all of their own ape men. In fact, that chart I showed you just before we came off a of screen share of the hundred of the small ape going to the big ape, and there's 15 animals on it. That chart was made in 1965, and that's a hundred years after 1859 when the theory came out. So it's about 106 years old. That's at the hundred year mark of human evolution, and yet the evolution scientists we interviewed. Not all of them would say 
not true, 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 not true. They overturned the eight men that were in the chart. You know, like, for example, Homo erectus was in the chart, and we interviewed evolution scientists said, it's a human, it's a Homo sapiens. You know, same with Neanderthal. It's a human, it's a Homo sapiens. And uh, yeah, so... um, yeah, that's so incredible. Very, I mean, really, that is that should be mind blowing for anybody listening right now. That, that, yeah, that's that these in, the evolutionary community has changed their mind on these transitionary they, they, forms. But they never give up on evolution. They they yeah. would uh, say no, it's not. But we still believe this is true. But I don't think they have a handle on the complete fossil record yeah. like I have. And I think once somebody gets a handle on that and the Big Bang and cetera, yeah. all of a sudden it starts to fall apart. I did. The first category, non-primate mammal, eight men, in the first book, volume three, but I can't do one volume for all nine categories. So I started to speed it up in the second book. And this book is called Nine Categories of Overturned Ape Men. And so the 232 ape men turned out, you could divide that were overturned, you could divide them into nine groups. The other groups of animals, they turned out to be, some of the ape men turned out to be just monkey bones. I'm not kidding. It's just monkey bones. I mean, that's hard I mean, I thought believe. the first group was wild, but yeah, that is crazy. Another group of ape men turned out to be just ape bones that weren't human ancestors. And I get that. You could make that mistake. One group of ape men, there's five ape men in this category, were recently buried humans. You know, like Uncle Larry's grave is up here or Grandma Jones, you know, she's up at the other cemetery. Somebody digs those up, you know, like a hundred year old fossils. I mean, My they're not goodness. fossils. And they made five ape men out of, out of those. It was Homo capensis, um, Homo cinnamento, Homo caput inclinatus, Homo pampeus, Tetraprothoma argentinus. So yeah, they had, so, and then another category was ape men that were created by scientists altering fossils you know, like the bad stuff, changing the fossils. Another category is eight men made out of reptile bones, and that's the one, the alligator uh, leg that turned out to be an eight man collarbone, <laughs> they said. And another category was eight men that were living today. They considered, the evolution scientists over the years have considered, not recently, but initially, considered all black people to be non human. And they were uh, species named Homo niger and things like that. And another category was ape men that were buried, I mean, humans that were buried during the ice age with like reindeer and things in Europe. And these humans that were buried with reindeer in the ice age were just normal humans like Cro-Magnum, but yet they said Cro-Magnum man had a split out toe, you know, great toe and Cro-Magnum man had this and this and it, it was all. So there's the nine categories. And you would think that I did a good job and you think I'm a really smart person, which is not true. I'm a very average person. And I was writing the back cover. This is two years ago of the nine, nine categories, this book. Okay. So I'm writing okay. the back cover and I'm, this book, just these two books on human evolution just came out in 2000, this year, 2024. And people can get those on Amazon or... Uh, yeah, you can get them on Amazon, but you'd be better off to come to my website just to see where, where you okay. could get them because that's a better f- place to find them. But and what is that? What's website, your website? Oh, uh, the grand experiment.com. Okay. Yeah. But two years ago, as I'm finishing up my three volume series on human evolution, I start to write the back cover. That's the last thing you do when you write a book. And I wrote this statement. I said, during the filming of this mini series and during the production while we're filming for these books, several instances of fraud were revealed by the evolution scientists or uncovered by us. And I just, I wrote that sentence. I said, that's a stupid sentence. That's, that doesn't, that doesn't sound very exciting. Several instances of fraud have been uncovered or revealed by the evolution scientists. What is several, Carl? And I didn't know. I, I was like, I don't know. I said, think about it. So here I am two years ago. I'm completed with this 25-year project. And I said, okay, let's go through them. And I think, okay, Nebraska man, there was two frauds there. 
uh, the, this chart on humans to apes. It was 10 frauds there. Lucy Johansson, three frauds there. And then this guy, this guy. And I start, and it's like, all of a sudden, I realize, oh my gosh, I miss this. I have been looking at everything, but probably the most important thing is how many frauds were there by the evolution scientists over these 150 years? And it turns out that I documented, and this is a clear documentation of just, it's not like I'm making up stuff. You can follow the, the documentation. 150 frauds that we documented in the field of human evolution by scientists working in the field of human evolution. 150. Wow. And you would think, if that's true, and then all the other problems with human evolution, because I'm just talking about the frauds. Now. I'm not talking about the other problems with human evolution. For example, there's the 232 overturned eight men, but that's not the frauds. And for example, they 45,000 times they misidentified ordinary rocks as eight man tools. And for example, they kept breaking the rules of science for how do you name a fossil? You know, like a dog is Canis familiaris and like a human is Homo sapiens. Yeah. But every yeah. time they found fossils, they would name them and then rename them and rename them and rename them. For example, Neanderthal man got 43 species names. Holy 43 cow. different. Yeah. For, and then, you know, it, go, it went from Homo neanderthalensis to Homo europaeus to Homo priscus. It goes on and on and on. And all that's documented in volume four. And like Homo erectus, that one has gone through 70 species names and genus, you know, different wow. genus names and 70 species names. They renamed it, renamed it. And both of those, Neanderthal man and Homo erectus, now scientists are saying those are Homo sapiens. So right there, there's 111 that overturned is, it, And just to recap, you know, what you're saying about this, the reason that that's so bad is that we would think, it's known that there's one species of humans that's it. Yes. Yes. And so they're saying that there's all these transitionary fossils for these in between, you know, monkey or, you know, common ancestor and mankind. And when you hear there's, there's 70 species, you think, wow, well, there's, there it is. There's the, you know, there's the transitionary forms right there, but no, this is all the same species. They're just and why is that? Why why are they? Is it the, do the scientists? I mean, it's just so they can make a name for themselves, and they they found a new quote species. Is that is that what's yes. happening there? Yeah, they, because you know these scientists are poor generally. They're looking for funding generally. Nobody's paying attention to them generally. And if you just find you know a fossil fish, nobody gives a darn. You're not going to get any attention. But if you could say, hey, I found a new ape man, the BBC will be at your doorstep the next morning, and uh, so will CNN. And uh, so if you find a fossil and it looks like the previous Neanderthal fossils, you don't call it Neanderthal man, and you don't call it Homo neanderthalensis or Homo sapiens. You say, no, this is something very different. And because under the left eyebrow ridge right here, there's a little dimple. <laughs> so this is not Homo Neanderthalensis. It's a whole new this species. Is, uh, it's a whole, and no, it's also, sometimes we'll call it a whole new genus group, you know, and it's wow. not Homo, but it's, yeah. So they did that. And if you don't believe this, and I accept that you would not believe this, you, you just go to volume four and it's all laid out in a chart. People in the audience here don't know me. They're, especially the evolutionists are going to say, I think this guy's full of bull. And I, I think he's just making these stories up. No, everything is documented. I want to show you the last volume in our human evolution series. It's the third volume, which I don't think you've read, but it's volume five, which is the bibliography for the first two okay. books. Okay, I do have it. I actually have all three of those. This is a uh, really a page turner. You should get this. Okay, okay. Now, okay. Now, so, so give a, reason, yeah, give a little explanation. What is because I, I I mean I'm thinking just from my you know, educational background, bibliography is the part that you don't read, you know? So what, what right. is the, uh, I, I I'm committed though. Cause I bought it, you know, I, I paid the, you know, I paid the money well, for it. All, so you got to see how thick it is. It's 432 pages. Thick. And, and look at these, what I did is 
I made this so anybody can verify anything I say wow. and see why I said it. And um, so that you would not have to pull up the article that I pulled up that was written. That's in incredible. Dutch. I've, you know, a lot of these articles had to be translated and you can't even get the journal. And so you have to pay money for the journal. So I'm going to, for one person to sacrifice their life for the, for the group, I'm going to do this and I'm going to translate wow. all these articles. And then I'm going to give you not just where this quote came from, but I'm going to give you the paragraph. So you see if I took it out of context, because, you know, the creationists are accused of quote mining, just taking a little sentence out of context. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. no Evolutionists this thing is never do that. Oh, no. No. <laughs> no. No. Even though, yeah. Their whole so, theory is quote mining. They've picked a couple of fossils. And it's just whatever they want it to be, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this then became a problem for me, AJ, because now I've been working on this for 25 years at this point. I just finished the th volume three about human evolution, volume four about human evolution, volume five about human evolution. And now I realize I missed enumerating these 150 frauds because I just made up the list in one in my mind after after I completed the books, I said, I'm not going to write another book. No way. That's just too much time. So fortunately, we have um, a video for each volume in the book series, like volume three about the barnyard animals. There's a video that goes with that. And volume four about the nine categories. There's a video for, for that. I said, you know what? People won't want to read many more books. I'll add to the video series and I'll do four episodes in the video series to enumerate the 150 frauds so you can see and count them along with me and see the interviews where the fraud occurred and they're wow. announcing the fraud wow. admitting fraud and so these last four videos in our in our eight-part video series episode five six seven and eight are the 150 frauds now there were so many again of the frauds i had to break them up into videos okay, into so, phyla <laughs> no, yeah into phyla say, i had to, like the evolutionary I had to break chart it. you know of all the different exactly <laughs> categories <laughs> exactly so episode i'm going to get the numbers wrong but you can get five six seven eight episode five is human evolution fraud by scientists working in the americas like north america and south america that's a 50 minute show and it goes through about 15 frauds and then this the next show episode six Human evolution fraud carried out by scientists working in Africa. That's about 60 frauds. That's wow. Raymond Dark, Robert Broom, Richard Leakey, Louis Leakey, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and these are the big names in the evolutionary community. These aren't random people. Like, you know, it, it, I'm trying to think of like big name Christian preachers. I mean, it would be yeah. like going yeah. throughout the last hundred years of big name Christian preachers and discrediting them yeah. like Billy Graham, you know, like say, Hey, and Billy Graham yeah. is a fraud and here's proof. Like this is a big, yeah. big deal. Yeah. And it'd be, yeah. Sturgeon fraud and Billy Graham and all that. Yeah. So the third video, not to belabor this, but the third video is again, it's a whole show. It's 50 minutes, 55 minutes long. Episode seven, human evolution. I mean, human evolution fraud carried out by scientists working in Europe. And there was, um, I have to think about how many there were, I might get these numbers wrong. Don't quote me, but it was like 60 or 70 or 80 wow. frauds. In Europe. Yeah. And it was by the, you know, the big names, you know, uh, the, the director of the Paris museum, the curator at the London museum, you know, um, university of Jena, et cetera, et cetera. And then the last episode is the current ape man that everybody in the evolution community is talking about, Tumai, T-O-U-M-A-I, it's also called Sahalensis Chadensis. Uh, but that one, it's on display in all the museums and it's a big, big fraud. And we spend about 45 minutes going over that one. And um, so, yeah, that was my savior that I didn't have to write another book. And if you want to first check me out about the frauds, unless you're a reader and you love reading, because some people are readers and just get the books, volume three and four, 
But if you want to just speed this up, process up, just get the last four episodes in our video series, episodes five, six, seven, and eight, and just watch them. It'll take you four nights to watch the four episodes. You can't, you can't binge them because there's too much. It, it is too yeah, long to binge yeah. them, you know. And, uh, and then you can see and make your own judgment for each fraud. Okay, was that a fraud? Was he overstating that? No, the, he, the, the scientist told a lie and he admitted it. You know, so you can go and count them. And I don't expect everyone to agree with me. You know, you might count them as 138 instead of 150. <laughs> or, <laughs> I don't know what it matters really, you know, if there's 138 or there's 100, you know, or 200. I mean, there's, there's yeah. widespread fraud. And we left out 200 frauds um, because one of the scientists wow. who admitted to committing fraud, Ernst Teckel, who committed 58 frauds, by the way, when he admitted in the Berlin newspaper in 1908 or so, something like that, it's in the video series, he said, I did commit a few frauds, but I'm not any worse than my colleagues. I know of hunt, <laughs> uh, paraphrasing. <laughs> okay. He says, I know of hundreds of examples of my colleagues doing what I did, altering diagrams and making stuff up. So I, don't think of me as the bad boy here because this is, I just did eight. Well, he really did 58. He told another lie there, but he did 58 frauds. But he said, my colleagues have done hundreds more. But I didn't include those because he didn't, you know, I have to have proof. I don't try to take anything secondhand or thirdhand. Sure. Yeah, so, you know, I just uh, I left those out. But you might count, hey, maybe 350 frauds. I don't know. I, I wouldn't go there. I would just say there's, uh, I call them 150. I I'm, I'm feel very confident about the 150. But whatever number you want, but it involves Lucy. It involves Neanderthal man. It involves Homo habilis. It involves Nebraska man. Nebraska man wasn't a mistake. It was a fraud, two frauds. It involves, uh, like I say, Tumai, et cetera, et cetera. The whole theory of naturalism has collapsed because they were holding on to that at least we have this good example of evolution human evolution we got all these eight men and now that collapses and i wouldn't be honest with you if i didn't say what really is going on in my brain hey that's it the whole theory of naturalism just collapsed. The Big Bang doesn't work. The origin of life doesn't work. The fossil record doesn't work. The best examples of evolution don't work. Human evolution doesn't work. And by the way, that's just the tip of the iceberg. I'm not going to even go into other problems with it. So, but that's enough to, for me as just being honest. And by the way, this is going to make me look like a fool. He's saying the whole thing has collapsed. You know, that sounds foolish. You know, I'd be better off just being very coy. And, but I, I, at some level, I have to just be honest. Yeah. If if what if, if what I just said is true, then you would have to conclude that there is no evolution. And if there's no evolution, that would mean there is a God. And if there is God, who is he? And we yeah. better all do yeah. our homework tonight, you know? You know, I, I think there are, there's a lot of people who, when you talk about this topic for the first time to people who are on the outside, you know, maybe they haven't had any exposure to a different... Uh, thought process. Oh, these are just some, you know, Christian kooks that are, you know, talking about whatever. In my opinion, just from a, just from an objective uh, standpoint, when I saw some of the pictures that you showed of these different like fragments, it's really generous to call it a fossil because really what we have is like crushed uh, fragments that they have pieced together. And I think really for almost every ape man that doesn't look like an ape or a man, it, it seems like it's these just bits and pieces that they have put together. And oftentimes, this is not an exaggeration, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that they find these these fragments and these pieces separated. Like yes, it's true. sometimes by substantial distances. Yes, it's true. And they Home bring them together and they make whatever they want to make out of it. And so like in my mind's eye, when I'm seeing this now, we're not presented with that. We're presented of the finished polished plaster cast that they make, that they create from their imagination. But like yeah. when I see, you know, and like you were saying, you, you can't even get in to see these originals, but, but the ones that you did and I, I was able to see, okay, look, these are just fragments. 
it blows my mind that this is actually that there's any credibility at all to this and that it's even allowed in the in the quote scientific community i mean they they call it science but really it's, it's just gross speculation and i think that's where you see the agenda come in that's that's where you see the you know that's that's where you see the imagination that's where you see that this the belief system part. I, I don't know how else to say it. It's, it's a, it's a, the, the, where they're plowing through despite lack of evidence, despite whatever, because they want to believe a certain thing, you know, that that's what you see in the scientific community. People don't want to believe that, but like when I see the evidence and I saw some of the pictures that that was where my mind went. Am I right on that with, with some of these yeah. supposed fossils that it's really not fossils, it's fragments and it's now they are fossil, but they're, they're not like a fossil skull. It's a fossil skull fragment. And yeah. It might yeah. Only yeah. Be, might, it might only be this. Yeah. I was saying it cause and, I think when people hear with their ears fossil, they're thinking what I've thought. And that's that they've discovered this objective complete skull. skeleton. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So when what is really that that you just showed us there? I would just, uh, um, Debbie says it's kind of macabre around here because I have, you know, I have uh, chimpanzee skulls on my desk. So and that's, a, ch that's a chimpanzee. So, that, so that's a yeah. full skull. That's a chimpanzee that's right. skull. That's right. When people hear fo we found a fossil, they think and they trust the scientific community that they're presenting us with something like you just showed us. But that's not what they're finding. They're finding crushed pieces and then so like with a lot of these all the pieces aren't there so they're ex or or in, i guess in some cases you've documented they are there but they're actually moving them to where they want them to be it, it makes so much of this really unbelievable when when you dig into the evidence you know you know it's science requires that other scientists can verify your findings yeah and this human evolution is not science because the evolution scientists do not allow their colleagues to have unfettered access to the fossils. <laughs> Just for example, what the, whatever, the eight or 10 ape men that they would consider to be valid today, uh, most of them, they were off limits. Like Tumai, uh, he won't let his colleagues see the fossil. Like Unbelievable. Uh, yeah, unbelievable. Uh, Artipithic, Artipithecus, the the museum in Ethiopia, the National Museum, won't let you see the original fossil. Do you wonder and, how there is an outrage, like public outrage, over some of this kind of stuff? You know, I mean, I, I think from a spiritual perspective, we understand why, because people, I think it's within human nature. The Bible teaches that people have a uh, they've got a sin nature, so we're by nature apart from Christ we're looking for a reason to behave the way we want to behave. And I think evolution provides us with that platform. When I hear things like you just said, I can't understand it from an objective point of view, why there isn't public outrage, because basically that tells me we're, we're being lied to. There's scant uh, evidence. Really, there's no evidence. And it's, um, and, and people aren't being provided access to information. You know, that's, that's just terrible. That's really terrible. The outrage is coming, AJ, because uh, up until the release of this book series, none of this was known. The outrage is coming. But it's going to take a, a number of years for the, this to get even read, you know, by the Christian community. Yeah. But I think the outrage is coming. It, it just, it really amazes me, you know, just from the perspective of a parent, of a Christian, I'm trying to, you know, do my best to raise kids in a culture and teach them Jesus. And the fact that we have to spend so much time combating this farce is, uh, it's really something, you know, it's, it's really something. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that's certainly my prayer, brother. I, and I appreciate your work because I, this was really the first time on this particular part of the whole evolutionary debate old earth versus young earth, that kind of stuff. Cause there's many different layers to it. No pun intended. You know, you get the whole geo there's geology, there's, you know, different astronomy. There's, there's all kinds of different, but 
the uh, the fossil record that was just something I didn't have a and, and I think your average person they can't travel around the world and mm-hmm. say hey show me the original fossil there Mr. Leakey you know they can't, they can't do that like but you've done it mm-hmm. and you've put mm-hmm. it in these resources so I honestly I just I can't encourage you enough if you're uh, looking at this for the first time if you're you know just becoming acquainted with uh, Dr. Carl Warner here that you, I just, I cannot encourage you enough to pick up a copy of his book, uh, to go to his website, get the DVD series, because it'll be an eye opener. And honestly, from a pastoral perspective, uh, do something with this information, like present it to your school board, present it to your pastor. I think that pastors need to be addressing this issue from the pulpit because it is, it has everything to do with the Bible and why people can trust the Bible and why they can trust Jesus for their salvation, because uh, evolution doesn't provide an adequate form of salvation for us, <laughs> but but the Bible certainly does. It certainly does. And um, if you have kids or you have a school system that you're involved with, or you're a grandparent you want to teach, there is a book. See, it says teacher's manual. Okay. There is a teacher's, there's a teacher's manual for all four of our books on Wonderful. fossils and, and and so you could go through this as a two two year curriculum starting in seventh grade or starting in ninth grade or starting in college or as an adult but it's a two year curriculum each semester covers one of our four books and it would be the pictures you saw today those are the pictures in the books and the kids I'm telling you the kids love these books and yeah. like the biggest danger we we keep hearing stories like the book arrives for a homeschool semester and the the kids scurry upstairs to their bedroom with the book evolution the grand experiment and they read it the whole whole book the first night you know? <laughs> and i'm serious because it's just they're easy read books you know yeah they are and really. so uh you this information if it dies with pastor aj and me we haven't done anything this is all a foolish waste of time because I'm not going to reach anybody else, you know, but it has to be you, the audience. Yes. Yeah. To take this to your kids, your grandkids, your school boards, like she, he said to pastors and, uh, and, and just spark starts, you know, shouting from the rooftops that the entire theory of naturalism has collapsed. Yeah, absolutely. Hey friends, I hope you enjoyed this interview with Dr. Carl Werner because we're doing a part two next week where we'll look at in detail 150 frauds in the category of overturned ape men. Hey guys, Pastor AJ here, and thanks for visiting my channel. If you don't mind, I'm going to take just a sec to tell you about Gospel Ministries and our mission to help others experience, demonstrate, and share God's great gospel. If you want, you can pick up some of our merch in our YouTube store to help you communicate that same gospel message. And I'd love it if you would consider subscribing to this channel so that we can challenge your Christian walk through solid biblical teaching as it applies to culture and other issues. In addition to that, you can go to PastorAJ.com where you can consider partnering with this ministry and sign up for my weekly email newsletter. Don't forget, I'm on all other social media platforms at Pastor AJ Platt. One other item that might interest you has to do with a topic that I've studied pretty extensively. It's my book, End Times Mission, that will give you a solid education on the different views of eschatology and, more importantly, your role in Jesus' kingdom while we wait for his return. This book covers the historical origins of popular end times teachings as it guides the reader to Christ's current reign in a post-millennial worldview. Oh, and one last thing. I want you to know that you know Jesus. So if you'd like to, leave a comment or send me a message so that I can help you do just that because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. 